Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and um, I want to talk today about statin drugs. I've talked a lot about statin drugs over the years but um, more and more research um, is, is being published about the futility of so much of what we do in medicine and this is really what this uh, particular broadcast is all about. So I'll just start by saying that in a general sense research shows that people who have test results that are only slightly abnormal for blood pressure or plasma cholesterol, for example, they're unlikely to benefit from taking drugs. Drugs are most useful for people who have serious health issues, but during the last several years, the criteria for prescribing drugs has changed so that more and more people qualify for treatment, which has resulted in considerable harm to patients and not a lot of benefit. One of the primary drivers for changing the diagnostic parameters, as you might imagine, is the influence of the drug companies who can make a whole lot more money when more and more people take higher and higher doses of drugs, and that's the impetus for doing it. Um, this is really the case with statin drugs. Expanding the market of patients who qualify to take the drugs has resulted in the prescribing of so much Lipitor that it is on target to become the first drug in history to hit a trillion dollars in sales by next year, 2020. So just a little bit of an historical perspective on statins. Um, cholesterol generated interest since it was discovered in 1784 as a component of gallstones. After a couple of centuries of research, which resulted in the awarding of uh, about 13, I think, Nobel Prizes, cholesterol was found in atherosclerotic plaques. Eventually high plasma cholesterol levels were linked to heart disease and research was undertaken to develop drugs that could lower it. And a long period of time went by. Some drugs were approved and later withdrawn. Some never made it to market. Others had serious side effects, which at the time when people were much more responsible about subscri uh, prescribing, um, really limited the number of patients who would take the drug. Merck was the first company to bring a well-tolerated statin drug to the market. Lovastatin, or Mevacor, was approved by the FDA in September of 1987. It was said to be effective for lowering LDL cholesterol and had few side effects. And then after that, um, lots of Me Too drugs, other statins followed, including Lipitor. While prescribing was initially limited to people who were at high risk of cardiovascular events, over, the to over time, the drugs were prescribed to more and more people, many of whom had very low risk and some of whom had absolutely no risk at all. So the U.S. National Cholesterol Education Program revised the definition of high cholesterol in 2005. This resulted in lowering the diagnostic threshold so that more people would be qualified to take statins. The revision, by the way, was not based on evidence that the changed parameters would lead to better outcomes, but rather based on the idea that lower cholesterol uh, must just be better. The conclusion was not surprising in view of the fact that eight out of the nine members of the panel had direct ties to companies that make statin drugs. In 2013, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association adjusted their guidelines based on the development of new risk calculators, which served to broaden the market even more. Based on this revision, it was estimated that an additional 12.8 million adults in the United States would be eligible to take statin drugs, with most of the increase taking place in older adults who did not have cardiovascular disease. A key issue here is the validity of the risk calculators, which were determined to be highly inaccurate. They're still used today, by the way, but one research group reported that four out of the five scores that were used in the calculator overestimated the risk of expected events between 25 and 115 percent, which is quite a bit. As a result of the changed guidelines, the number of people taking statins increased, but the value of the drugs for most people was almost zero. One study showed that taking Lipitor reduced the risk of a heart attack by only 1.1%, and another study showed that taking Lipitor extended lifespan by an average of only three to four days. Really dismal. This has generated a considerable amount of debate. It's been confusing to both the prescribers and patients. For example, in 2016, the US Preventive Services Task Force guidelines recommended that 16% of adults between 40 and 75 years of age without prior cardiovascular disease qualified to take statin drugs. The American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, on the other hand, had developed guidelines that recommended that 24% of adults in the same age range should take the statins. So a new analysis that caught my attention in view of all of this uh, shows that statin use and lower risk patients, quote, 
may be an example of low value care having little benefit and potential to cause harm in these patients and in some cases represents a waste of healthcare resources. The study looked at the use of statins for primary prevention, in other words, for a person who's never had an event, and a, a cohort of older people in Ireland. The review showed that 30% of these older adults were using statins and two thirds of them were taking the drugs for primary prevention. The researchers then looked at how changing European guidelines between 1987 and 2016 affected this cohort. In 1987, 8% of the cohort would have qualified to take a statin drug, but by 2016, that number increased to 61% of the cohort that was qualified. A windfall for the drug companies, but what about the impact on patients? Well, tens of millions of people are taking statin drugs for primary prevention, but there are really few research studies that have looked at this population to determine the value of treatment. The researchers were able to identify three systematic reviews that looked at the issue. The data showed that based on 1994 prescribing guidelines, the number needed to treat in order to prevent one cardiovascular event was 40. In other words, 40 people had to take the drug for one person to benefit. Now the researchers think and express that this was, quote, a reasonable number, but I'll disagree. I guess I see it the other way. This means that 39 out of 40 people do not benefit from taking a statin drug. That's 97.5% of people don't benefit, which means all side effects, if they happen, no benefit. But the numbers are just outrageous if you go to the 2016 guidelines with a number needed to treat a 400. In other words, 399 patients out of 400 would not benefit from taking statins for primary prevention, while less than 0.0025% would benefit. Again, great for the drug companies. This is a windfall, but not so much for the patients. The researchers provided two examples illustrating the two impacts, of the impact, the true impact of the drugs. And the first example was a 65-year-old smoker, doesn't have heart disease, but has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and a 38% risk of having a major coronary event in 10 years. So this would appear to be a person who would benefit from a statin. In fact, the patient would reduce his risk by 9%, still have a 28% risk in, in, uh, in the next 10 years. Um, the authors say that this justifies the prescribing of the statin. Now the number needed to treat is 11, significantly better than 400, right? But the drug is still ineffective for most people who take it and the risk still remains high at 28% that this patient would have an event even with the use of the statin in the next 10 years. The second example was much more clear cut, a 45 year old woman with high cholesterol and slightly elevated blood pressure. Her risk of an event within 10 years is only 1.4% and her risk reduction from taking the statin drug is 0.6% less than 1% with the number needed to treat 166. The authors state that prescribing a statin is just simply not justified for this person. The researchers concluded that essentially none of the people classified as low or moderate risk in primary prevention benefit from taking statins. Instead, patients at low to moderate risk only have side effects, which, mean, which include myopathy, development of type 2 diabetes, hemorrhagic stroke. In fact, the incidence of myopathy is as high as 530 cases out of 10,000 people who are treated for five years with statins. It might be that this analysis, even though it's still pretty dismal, paints a rosier picture of statin drugs than they deserve because the authors are using the inaccurate risk calculators to determine the risk of an event, which in turn would determine the risks and benefits of treatment. So if the calculators are wrong and they err on the side of overestimating events, then statins are being given even more credit than they deserve. So this is a pretty dismal view of statin drugs for primary prevention, but it might actually be worse. The bottom line is that few people benefit from taking these widely prescribed drugs and a much better option is to lower plasma cholesterol naturally whenever possible with diet and lifestyle change. So going back to the 65 year old smoker who takes a statin and his risk reduction is 9% still has a 28% risk of having an event within the next 10 years. That risk could be ratcheted down a whole lot more with diet and lifestyle change. Um, this is an exercise, by the way, that we could do with many, many popular drugs that are prescribed all the time. For example, blood pressure drugs and drugs for thyroid and that sort of thing. Sometimes necessary, often not, more and more prescribed for people who don't qualify to take them. Uh, so the, the consumer has to be very, very wary 
of, um, of these types of things. You know what I say, and those of you who've been listening to me a long time, unless it's an emergency, don't do anything now. Look into it, find out what the real data look like, like what I've presented here, and then make your choice. All right, that's it for today, it for the week. Um, keep those inquiries coming about courses and professional development and careers and healthcare, doing the types of things we do here. Uh, we have some big plans for next year. We'd love to share them with you. Maybe you'd like to get involved. Um, hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber and the little bell will give you a notification when new videos are posted. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you next week with more news.